Um, we, we didn't mean to put up RT, RTF, we really still are Internet Research Task Force. Um, and with any luck, I have now updated the slides. Um, so, welcome. Uh, I, uh, I'm not going to give you slides. I know you've memorized the note well, so we're not going to show it to you, but there will be a test at the end of the session. And, um, and just so you know, IRTF abides by the IETF's note well. So if you've seen it multiple times, you're, you've seen it for us as well. We just changed it so it says IRTF. Um, this is um, the day, the week of a change of, of command in the IRTF. And I want to introduce you to Colin Perkins, if you don't already know him, and welcome him. He'll be running things from here on. Um, and we have three presentations of ANRP speakers. The, Applied Networking Research Prize. Um, they, um, there are normally two, but one of our presenters was unable to attend last time. And they're going to be terrific talks about large-scale hard problems. So we'll start out with Brandon Schlinker's talk. Brandon is um, with Facebook and University of Southern California. And his award paper is called Engineering Egress with Edge Fabric, Steering Oceans of Content to the World. And take it away, Brandon. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandon Schlinker from the University of Southern California. Today, I'm going to be talking about Edge Fabric, a system we built at Facebook to deliver traffic to end users around the world. So let's start off here with a brief overview of Facebook's network. Facebook has dozens of points of presence around the world and interconnects with thousands of networks. Now that rich interconnection with those thousands of networks offers Facebook two distinct advantages. First, it provides us with short, direct paths to end users, which means that we can bypass transit providers that have traditionally been part of the internet hierarchy. Second, it provides us with substantial path diversity, meaning that for any given end user, we often have multiple distinct paths that we can use to send them traffic. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into what goes on in interconnection at a pop, and then I'm going to go into the challenges that exist for interconnection. So first, at every pop around the world, we have one or more edge routers. We establish physical interconnections or circuits between those edge routers and other networks. So in this case, we've established an interconnection with an end user ISP and also with a tier one transit provider. Next, we use BGP, or the Border Gateway Protocol, to exchange reachability information with those networks. So in this example, the end user ISP, we receive routes to their end users across the network interconnection that we've established with them. And we also receive a route from that tier one transit provider. Third, BGP at our router to select which of those routes we're going to use. And in this case, it selected that route through that, from that end user ISP directly. So what are the challenges to using all this rich interconnectivity? Well, our key objective here is to deliver traffic with the best performance possible. But the challenge to doing that is that BGP doesn't consider demand, capacity, or performance in its decision process. So let's take a look at what problems that creates. We have here a simple example. Facebook on the left is trying to deliver five gigabits per second of traffic to the end users and the ISP on the right. Now our router is configured to use those short direct paths that we prefer. And so as a result, it puts all of that load onto that upper path and everything's fine. Until later on in the day, now demand has risen. We're now at 12 gigabits per second of demand. And again, BGP at that router can't, be adopt, can't adopt to demand or capacity in real time. It's simply not possible to express that with BGP's policy terms. So as a result, the router continues to make the same decision, and it ends up overloading that link, leading to packet loss and degrading user performance. Likewise, BGP doesn't consider performance in its decision process. A simple example of that can be seen here. That upper preferred route now has a securitous route on it, so it's added 50 milliseconds of latency. And also some piece of equipment downstream is misfunctioning or malfunctioning, adding loss. So in this scenario, the route through that, se that second route through that transit provider would actually be preferred. It offers us better performance, 
But we can't configure BGP to adopt performance in real time, and so we end up still placing all that traffic onto the less preferred poor performing route. Now, despite all these problems with BGP and how it doesn't account for capacity or performance, it's still fundamental to interconnection, and it's not going away anytime soon. The thousands of networks that Facebook and other large content providers connect with all expect for us to use the BGP protocol. So what that means we need to do is we have to sidestep BGP's limitations. And what I'm going to talk about next is how we do that by shifting control from BGP at our edge routers to a software controller. So I've briefly gone over Facebook's network uh, and an overview of the challenges. Next, I'm going to dive deeper into our connectivity and the challenges. Then I'm going to talk about how we sidestep BGP's limitations with Edge Fabric. I'll then talk about Edge Fabric's behavior in production. And finally, I'll talk about the evolution of Edge Fabric and some ongoing work. So back to those points of presence that we have around the world. At each of those, we have three types of connectivity. First, we have transit providers. And transit providers can deliver traffic to the entire internet. At each pop, we typically have two or more of these for redundancy. And we connect with them through a private circuit, or sometimes known as a private network interconnection. Then we have peers. And we separate peers into two different categories. And I'm going to go into detail on why we do that a little later. But in general, we have private peers, on which there are on the order of tens per pop. And again, we connect with them through private circuits. And we have IXP, or public peers, that we interconnect with via internet exchange points. And those are on the orders of hundreds per pop, and we interconnect with them through a shared fabric, which means we don't have a direct circuit between our routers and theirs. So how do we prefer across these different routes? What is, what's our router configured to do? In general, we apply this very simple policy. We prefer routes from private peers over internet exchange point peers over transit providers. Now, we prefer peers over transits because peers provide a short, direct path to end users. And we prefer private over internet exchange point peers because we prefer circuits that are dedicated to have dedicated capacity between Facebook and the peer. So as a result of that routing policy, the vast majority of our traffic actually egresses through these private peers. But that creates a problem because we cannot acquire sufficient capacity with our private peers to satisfy all demand. We always try to do this, but due to logistical constraints and business constraints, it's simply not always possible for us to establish sufficient capacity. And as a result, you can end up with scenarios like the one I illustrated earlier, where during a peak time period or perhaps during a failure, you have a link that becomes overloaded due to BGP's decision process. So how big of a problem is this? Well, to understand that, we did a two-day study of 20 points of presence, which is a subset of our production network. And we identified circuits that would have been overloaded with BGP's default routing decision process, based on the, uh, the policy I described earlier. And overloaded here means that demand would have been greater than the circuit's capacity. And what we found is that at 17 out of 20 points of presence, they had at least one circuit that would have been overloaded. And 18% of all circuits across these 20 pops would have been overloaded at least once. Now to further dive into how big of a problem this is, let's take a look at what the circuit peak demand is to its capacity for circuits where we predicted that the demand was going to be greater than its capacity at least once. And what I have here is on the y-axis a CDF of circuits where the demand exceeded the capacity. And on the x-axis is their peak demand relative to their capacity. So a peak demand here of two indicates they had twice as much demand as the circuit's actual capacity. So two key points I want to pull from this. First, 50% of circuits had peak demand that was greater than 1.19x their capacity. And then 10% of circuits had peak demand that was greater than twice their capacity, indicating that some circuits, 10% in this case, are drastically under-provisioned relative to their, their uh, peak demand. So going back, again, BGP doesn't consider demand or capacity. And as a result, in these situations where demand exceeds capacity, we're going to end up with packet loss and degraded user experience. BGP's decision process, in general, doesn't meet our needs. We don't want degraded user experience. And that's why we built Edge Fabric. 
So next I'm gonna talk about how we sidestep BGP's limitations by using Edge Fabric. And stepping back, that again involves shifting control from BGP at routers at the edge of our network to a software controller. So before I dive into what our implementation actually is, I wanna talk about our two key design priorities here. First, we focused on, on minimizing, op on, sorry, maintaining operational simplicity, which means minimizing change and minimizing system complexity. Second, we wanted to have ease of deployment, which means we wanted to interoperate with our existing infrastructure and tooling. We have BGP routers at the edge of our networks, like most network operators do. We already have existing tooling for interacting with BGP. So we wanted a system which could interact with that existing infrastructure. So in general, there's two key extremes in terms of how you can do routing on a network. On the left-hand side here, there's what most network operators do today, which is traditional routing. I have my routers at the edge of my network perform our configure routes on a per destination basis based on what they've learned from BGP. On the right-hand side, I have another extreme, which is host-based routing. And that's where each host makes a decision on what the route of that packet's going to be, and then uses some signaling method, such as MPLS or GRE, to signal to the routers at the edge of the network how to, how to handle that uh, packet. So Edge Fabric's approach balance is balanced between these two extremes. We have a controller that overrides BGP's decisions at the router, and when our hosts provide hints on packet priority, but don't precisely uh, specify how the packet should be egressed from our network. So what does this approach look like? Well, first, routers at the edge of our network keep selecting routes like they do today using BGP. We still have all of our BGP sessions with other networks terminated at those routers. So in this case, our router, based on all the information that's received, has selected route A. Edge Fabric also selects ideal routes, but in addition to all that BGP routing information, it also has access to other inputs. And in this case, that means advanced policy information, such as, for instance, us configuring based on business reasons or reasons provided to us by a peer, prefix traffic rates, circuit capacities, and route performance measurements. So Edge Fabric takes all of that additional input, and it also makes a decision. And in this case, it's decided to use Route B. So our router and Edge Fabric have chosen different routes. We need to resolve this. The way we handle that is, in this case, Edge Fabric injects an override to that router using BGP, which I'll go into a little bit later, and forces that router to select the route that Edge Fabric prefers. So Edge Fabric can perform two types of overrides. It can override BGP's decision in order to move traffic for a set of end users. So for instance, we can say on a per destination basis, override what BGP would typically do, which is perhaps send that traffic via a peering link and instead send it via a transit link. It can also move a specific class of end user traffic. So for instance, I can send low priority traffic, which is perhaps non-video traffic over uh, which would have traditionally, or by BGP, been routed over my peering link, and I can instead shift that to a transit link. So let's take a look at how the, all of this comes together to prevent congestion in our network. And we're going back to that example I showed earlier, where we have Facebook on the left trying to deliver 12 gigabits per second of traffic to this ISP on the right. And BGP, by default, is gonna put all of that traffic onto that upper link because we always prefer those short direct paths from peers. And as a result, that link's going to become overloaded. So what Edge Fabric does is it understands that this 12 gigabits per second of demand is actually composed of two prefixes. And in this case, it understands that if it shifts one of these prefixes away and shifts that traffic to an alternate link, in this case, the path via the transit provider, that it's going to prevent congestion on the peering link without causing congestion anywhere else. So how does this work at the BGP level? Well, we take that transit route that we've selected, we inject it via BGP, and then BGP at all of our routers is configured to prefer routes from Edge Fabric. And we do that by configuring local pref on the BGP sessions for Edge Fabric, such that the local pref of its routes is always the highest and thus preferred. So Edge Fabric monitors BGP's decisions and overrides them as needed to prevent congestion in our network. 
Edge Fabric is able to support a variety of traffic engineering policies because it operates over a variety of inputs and it can perform overrides on a variety of granularities. And more importantly, it's compatible with our existing BGP infrastructure, which means that what we've truly achieved with Edge Fabric is centralized control over the dis traditionally distributed BGP decision process. Going back to those design priorities I introduced earlier, Edge Fabric meets our goals of operational simplicity because we can always fall back to BGP at the routers if Edge Fabric fails. It allows operators to continue to use our existing tools because routes are injected to those routers via BGP. And synchronization is only required between Edge Fabric and routers. Likewise, it meets our goal of ease of deployment. BGP sessions with external peers remain at those routers. We don't need to shift them elsewhere in our network. And we use industry standards for route and traffic information, such as BMP, IPFIX, and SFLOW. So let's take a look at how Edge Fabric behaves in production, and in particular, criteria that we use to evaluate its performance. Edge Fabric entered production in 2013 with the primary objective of preventing circuit congestion that we were seeing on peering circuits at that time. It runs per pop and it executes every 30 seconds, meaning it takes in both route information and current traffic information, and then determines, based on its decision process, where traffic should go, and then injects routes via BGP. It controls 100% of Facebook's global egress traffic. So one of the things we have to decide when a link is projected to be overloaded, which means that Edge Fabric believes that the demand would be greater than its capacity, is how much traffic Edge Fabric should move off of that link. Now, if we move uh, very little traffic, only enough to get down to 100% utilization, then we're going to end up with packet loss during bursts. Likewise, if I move a significant amount of traffic and now I'm at 50% utilization, now I'm getting poor utilization of those short direct links and I'm not uh, making good use of my capacity. So in general, what we strive for based on operational experience is achieving 95% utilization. And this allows us to have high utilization with tolerance for bursts in traffic. Now the key question here is, can we maintain that utilization without any packet loss? So what we're going to look at now is two key questions. Can Edge Fabric prevent circuit congestion and packet loss? And can we keep the utilization of circuits at that 95% threshold? What we did here is we measured across our network during that two-day measurement period. And what we found is when Edge Fabric is shifting traffic away, meaning that it believes that a link would be overloaded if it didn't intervene, 99.99% of the time, there was no packet drops on that link. Likewise, when Edge Fabric wasn't active, which means it wasn't shifting traffic away from a link, there was no packet drops. So this means that Edge Fabric intervened when needed and it successfully prevented circuit congestion. Now the next question here is, can we keep utilization at that 95% threshold? And to analyze that, what we did is we looked at the circuit utilization against the threshold every 30 seconds for circuits where Edge Fabric was actively intervening. And in this figure, what we want is as much around that zero mark as possible because that means we're keeping the utilization right at that 95% threshold. Anything to the left means that the utilization is lower. Anything to the right means that it's higher and we end up with potential loss during bursts. So what we find here is that the vast majority of the time, we're able to keep the utilization of these interfaces or these circuits within 2% of that threshold. So Edge Fabric is able to successfully prevent circuit congestion and packet loss, and it can do that while keeping circuit utilization at this high threshold. So now I'm going to talk about the evolution of Edge Fabric and some ongoing work. So I talked earlier about those two extremes of how you can have routing decisions made at the edge of your network at routers, or you can have routing decisions made at your hosts. And when we actually started off with Edge Fabric, we were doing the other extreme, routing decisions made at our hosts. And that's called host-based routing. So in this model, what Edge Fabric would do is it would inject its decisions directly into our servers. And then our servers would use MPLS, DSCP, or GRE, depending on the generation of Edge Fabric this was, to signal to routers at the edge of our network, send this packet through circuit X. 
Now, a key challenge there is maintaining synchronization. You have to keep routing state maintained across all of your hosts. And if, let's say, circuit X disappears, my servers need to know that now that it's no longer a valid option for them to route traffic via. In comparison, what we do today, this edge-based routing approach that I described, has Edge Fabric inject its decisions into routers at the edge of our network, and overrides are enacted by those routers. Hosts don't signal the precise path that they want a, a pack to take. Instead, they just signal to the router information about that packet's uh, traffic <coughs> class, such as this is a video packet. So this means that we don't have any host synchronization, which in our network drastically reduces <coughs> the complexity of a system like Edge Fabric. Further, we have flexibility with DSCP signaling because we can account for different classes of traffic, and we can always fall back to BGP at our edge routers. So both of these approaches provide the capabilities we want today, but in general, edge fabric is best aligned with the design priorities that I described earlier. <coughs> the next thing I want to briefly go over is about congestion beyond the edge of our networks. And for this example, I'm going to talk about internet exchange points. So internet exchange points allow networks to interconnect through a shared switch. So in this case, Facebook and another content provider may both connect to this big IXP shared switch, and downstream end user networks may connect as well. So internet exchange points are often seen as removing barriers to interconnection. I don't have to provision cross connects between me and all of these other networks that I want to interconnect with. But they also create a key challenge, and to see why, let's take a look at this example. In this case, both Facebook and this other content provider have hundreds of gigabits per second of capacity to this internet exchange point switch. In this case, Facebook wants to send eight gigabits per second of traffic to those end users, and the other content provider, six gigabits per second. Now, the problem here is that ISPX, they only have 10 gigabits per second of capacity. As a result, we end up with the same problem that I illustrated earlier. Demand here is greater than available capacity. We're ending up with congestion and packet loss. Now, the key problem here is that these networks on the left, Facebook and this other content provider, have no visibility past their network edge. They have no understanding of what that other network's circuit capacity is downstream. And even if they did, they can't see each other's traffic. From Facebook's perspective, eight gigabits per second is fine for a 10 gigabit per second link, and likewise for the other content provider. Now, this isn't just a problem for internet exchange points. It's anywhere past your network edge, you simply lack visibility. I can't see into what a private peer or an internet exchange point or a transit provider has as problems downstream. So what can we do to identify congestion beyond the edge of our network? Well, we looked at a few different signals before. We were looking, for instance, at prefix traffic rates, so I could figure out how much of Facebook's traffic is going to go on the circuit. Again, that doesn't work here because tra cross traffic beyond our edge from other content providers is being mixed in, and we don't know how much traffic they have. Circuit capacities, oftentimes you aren't going to know downstream. How much capacity does my transit have with the end user network? I have no idea. And what that means is you have to instead use route performance measurements. You have to infer congestion from these performance measurements, but that can be particularly challenging because you can see things such as latency increases, and you aren't sure as to whether that's due to a path change or a change in client population or due to actual congestion. Likewise, you don't know how much traffic to shift. You have to continuously probe for capacity as downstream a failure may occur, reduce capacity for 20 minutes, and then be resolved. So it requires a trial and error discovery process. Likewise, those interactions with other networks also create complexity. You, they may also respond to congestion signals and thereby reduce the amount of traffic they're putting on those links. And you may increase your traffic and you may oscillate together. So it's very difficult to get a signal here as to how much traffic should I put on this link. Even if you know the current status of congested or not, that doesn't mean that five minutes from now it's going to be in that same status. So stepping back from all of this, what's really new here? These problems in general have been known for quite some time. BGP hasn't considered demand, capacity, or performance ever in terms of the inter-domain inter setup. 
And what we see as new here is the scale of connectivity, traffic, and quality of service demands that both content providers and end users have. And that brings new challenges and opportunities. So stepping back again, those rich interconnection that I described earlier, it offers content providers like Facebook a number of advantages, providing short, direct paths that can bypass transfer providers, and substantial path diversity. But in terms of meeting our goal of delivering traffic with the best performance possible, we're challenged by BGP's limitations, because BGP doesn't consider demand, capacity, or performance. And as a result, we built Edge Fabric, which has allowed us to sidestep BGP's limitations by shifting control from routers at the edge of our network to software. And the result has been a more efficient network and better performance for our end users. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. There's a question that came in from the, a, a remote participant. <clears throat> Bruno asked, how does the controller tell a router to redirect traffic for a specific traffic, class of traffic? For example, do you use BGP flow spec? So in this case, what we have actually at each router, there's multiple routing instances. And those routing instances, the DSCP marked packets, arrive at each instance based on the DSCP value. So for instance, DSCP value 50 will arrive at routing instance 50. And we inject routes into each of those instances. If there's no route injected, the router will fall back to the default routing instance. So this allows us to customize on a per destination, per classic traf uh, per classic traffic class as to whether or not we're going to override the route. He says, thank you, crystal clear. Okay. Don't forget to say your names. Uh, Kathy Aronson, I'm just curious, do you have any mechanism for ingress traffic or is it just that your traffic is so um, heavily egress that this is the most important? Uh, yeah, I would say in general our traffic is, is primarily egress, so it ends up being a much larger problem for egress yeah. traffic. Okay. Um, for ingress traffic, it comes down to more of load balancing using DNS entries or other, other things like that to send between pops. Uh, Aaron Falk. Um, so it seems like one thing, one of the effects of uh, this mechanism is that it increases sort of the, the dynamics of uh, route changes for that uh, packets experience. And I'm wondering if you've looked at the impact that this has on individual flows. I mean, my experience with Facebook is that most objects are pretty small, but, I, uh, but uh, it, uh, it's unlikely that both paths are going to have the same uh, latency. And so uh, for a particular flow, if you get switched, you're going to have things like reordering. And um, you know, are there, um, uh, have you looked at sort of the, the how, frequent, how much traffic is shifting when you make these decisions? How many flows are interrupted? That kind of thing. Like, what's the, where, how much of an impact is this? Sure. So the way the decision process works today is it's likely going to continue to select the same routes or the same uh, destinations to, sh to shift as the load increases. So let's say I'm 100 megabits per second over my capacity. I'll choose X to shift. Now I'm 200 megabits per second. I choose X and Y. And what that means is that once we've shifted something over, we're likely to continue to shift it. It's not always that we will. Uh, there is some level of optimization there where um, we can change what we're shifting over time. But as a result, we don't end up with, with rapid oscillations for the same set of flows. And do you have any statistics on um, how much shifting is happening? I don't have any uh, statistics in terms of how much shifting is, is happening, no. Um, in general, I expect that for TCP, in terms of the reordering problem, it would be very brief on the, on the flows that we're actively transmitting at the time. Um, and yeah, we, we can take this offline further, Ed. Uh, hi, Brandon. I'm Dave Planka. Uh, neat idea about uh, injecting the BGP prefixes, and, and I guess the failure mode then is if the edge fabric doesn't work, it falls back to BGP. I was wondering about, you gave an example where you showed two non-adjacent v4 prefixes aggregating to more than the bandwidth on the on the 10 gig and you selectively chose one to offload say two and a half gigs of traffic or something right um where did you get those prefixes from do you synthesize them from what you know is downstream or are they pre-configured um the, you know what what degrees of freedom do you have to 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 make more specifics or things uh in, in the when you have a peer that has a uh, a bunch of aggregate prefixes. Sure. So the, the general aggregation here is we get samples from IPFix or SFlow. 
we aggregate them up to the most specific prefix advertised by a VGP. Um, and then we do break those prefixes apart again further. So let's say I have a slash 20, which is one gigabit per second of traffic. We'll break that slash 20 up into smaller prefixes, slash 21 or slash 22, until we get down to a certain granularity. So in this case, I think we discussed in the paper uh, sh splitting up until we get at least 250 megabit per second granularity, which would mean that then when we're shifting traffic, we can shift in 250 megabit per second buckets. So that allows us to keep that utilization at that high threshold. Okay, and then one other thing about the prefixes that was curious to me is you showed a V4 example, but you guys are heavily V6 and do both. Do you make any effort to find the corresponding V4 and V6 prefixes and move them together, or do you treat them independently? No, the decision processes are independent. We actually prefer to move V4 you know, before V6, and that's because uh, V6, we've seen cases where you shift it to a different route. That route is actually black holing the traffic, and then you end up oscillating because you shift away and back each time, the prefix, and uh, this is likely just because of V6 routes being less groomed than V4. Yes, my name's Stuart Shasher from Apple. Throughout the presentation, you talked about demand uh, as being a fixed thing. Like we have 12 megabits of demand or 12 gigabits of demand going into a 10 gigabit pipe. Right. Uh, but if you're, all the transport protocols I know, like TCP and QUIC, uh, adapt to throughput. And <clears throat> if you send a sustained 12 gigabits into a 10 gig pipe and lose 20%, it's not going to continue losing 20% the senders are going to slow down that rate. So <clears throat> uh, I, I didn't understand why uh, the normal congestion control algorithms to adjust rate did not uh, slow down when they're too fast and conversely speed up when they're too slow. If there's excess capacity, TCP will speed up until it uses all the capacity because there's, there's no such thing when I'm looking at Facebook as loading a picture too fast. Right? I want it to load as fast as it can, which should be all the capacity that's available. So to be clear here, when, when I say 12 gigabits per second of demand, that's what our controller sees as the demand to that prefix at that moment in time. The reason that it can be greater than that link's capacity is likely because we've shifted traffic away from that link on a previous iteration. So I may have, let's say I have a single prefix that if I was to send all through this link, it would be congested. I would have shifted it away on a previous iteration. Now its, its utilization has been able to continue to climb. And so now we're actually above what the link's capacity is. Um, in terms of the transit port protocols reacting, you're right, but you're still gonna end up with a poor user experience uh, as you're still gonna end up with packet loss in order for those transport protocols to, to react. Um, also, many of our shorts, our, our flows are very short, which means that um, you have a lot of flows constantly going through slow start, which means that they're gonna end up interacting poorly when you're ending up with, with a lot of congestion in the link. Thank you. Vasily Dalmatov, Kryptonite. It's not a question, it's quite a remark. Uh, you are struggling with the all good old problem of a congestion link and information about congestion. So you stopped just one step before reinventing frame relay and means of struggling with conversion in frame relay. I hope it will be a result of your ongoing work and you propose something like back and forth with BGP. Thank you. Uh, Joe Ampley, um, this might be in the paper, I haven't read it, but you, you implied, I think, when you were looking for congestion off net through exchange points or in remote networks, that you're doing active probing to look for congestion conditions. And I was wondering if you'd considered pulling those kinds of insights directly from TCP, where you already kind of have, in a, with a passive observation, some indication of whether transport protocols are being throttled even before packet loss exists. So, so we have an extensive TCP pipeline that we look at, at these events on. Um, uh, that's other work that we're looking at publishing, so. Rudiger Volk, Deutsche Telekom. I wonder uh, that the primary and first control that you have for directing your traffic uh, seems not to be mentioned and, uh, well, okay, uh, feedback, uh, not explained, and the first thing that you, I guess, are doing is 
um, the server selection, deciding to which of your server clusters at which location you direct the queries of, this, uh, of the customers. Um, and um, uh, uh, I guess I guess some uh, of well, okay. Essentially, the predictions of how much traffic will be generated this way from each of the server clusters uh, goes into Edge Cast uh, into Edge Fabric uh, as the ex estimation of the uh, required uh, or of the generated demand for the for the volume. Um, but uh, kind of, I wonder, is there no feedback that actually uh, feeds back? Uh, we are having a difficult situation in what, for one of the connections of server clusters. Um, and please, re, please reshape the distribution of traffic between the servers. So to be clear, there's, there's two controllers here. I don't talk about the other one. There is a global controller which decides which point of presence around the world an end user's traffic will be sent to. And then there's this local controller which at each point of presence decides how we're going to egress that traffic. Those two systems do have some cohesion between them um, and the interactions that you described do exist. In terms of how we decide what the demand is for each point of presence, that's not based on the global load balancer. That is based on IP fix or SFLOW measurements at that local pop. So that allows us to get in near real time, every 30 seconds, exactly right now, how much load there is at that location. Thank you so much. Um, well, you can uh, ask more questions by the Jabber if you like. But anyway, thank you, Brennan, for a great talk. Um, and our next speaker is uh, another ANRP 2019 awardee, Florian Streibel, who is at um, Max Planck Institute Saarbrück. And uh, your top, his topic is BGP communities, even more worms in the routing can. <laughs> thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here. And I think I should uh, adjust that. Okay, so this talk is uh, on a even nearer. Well. So this talk is on a paper at IMC last year, um, as already mentioned, even more worms and routing can. And uh, full disclosure, part of this work was presented at last ITF meeting by Randy uh, at Grow, um, but now you will get the full take. So we were looking at uh, BGP data that we collected, and if you uh, follow this, this development, um, you see a large increase of uh, BGP communities being used. Um, over the last eight years, um, we have seen more than 296% of increase of uh, BGP communities being used, so individual values in BGP communities. Um, and I looked up yesterday, uh, it further increased, so uh, last year um, around uh, 5,000 ASs were using uh, BGP communities, and now it's up to 10,000, and we see 74,000 individual values for short communities. So, uh, for me as a researcher, this, this means I should probably take a look what's actually happening there. So, uh, what are we talking about? We are talking about the short BGP communities. Uh, you probably know they are defined in RST 1997. They are a 32 bit value usually split in half, so the first 16-bit being an AS number, the latter 16-bit being a value where each peer or each AS is agreeing up, upon values with their peers, what they should mean or what they are being used for. So there is no strict semantics in it. Peers have to agree upon it on themselves. And um, as you have noticed, it's only 16-bit, so uh, we now have uh, AS numbers which are larger than 16-bits. Uh, finally, we get the large communities defined in RFC 1892, and they are now at 12 byte values. So now we have three, uh, three um, fields, uh, each with um, significant space to use them. So four byte ASMs, ASs can actually use communities now. Uh, here, the first four bytes are now defined to be a global administrator, so it's now clear that this is actually an AS number, and this is the, the network defining the meaning of the uh, community. So um, this is actually a good thing. Um, besides the confusion of the naming, if it's a long or large communities, um, we spotted other problems. 
uh, when we tried to do our measurements, um, the large communities were not really used in, uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, we only found 51 global administrators actually using them. Um, so nothing we could actually measure on the internet scale. This has, um, has been become better, um, and if you're interested in uh, the uptake of uh, large communities, Emil from RIPE has uh, set up uh, or has published an article uh, where he looked into the development of uh, large communities and the uptake. So now we have around 120 global administrators that are using large communities. So, but how are they being used? Um, at all, the, or in general, uh, communities can be split into two groups. Uh, we have informational communities that have uh, passive semantics. They are used for location tagging. Where has this prefix been learned in which uh, pop uh, RTT tagging we have seen? And on the other side, we have uh, action communities that carry active semantics. They are used for triggering black holding or actions in other ASs, for example, path prepending. The problem here is without documentation of these, of these values, you cannot see if this is an active or passive community or if the, the semantics is active or passive, because as already mentioned, the peers decide themselves what these community values mean. And there is no bit indicating if it's active or passive or an action community. Uh, and this leads into s uh, several uh, s uh, sorts of problems. So given the increasing popularity of BGP communities that we have seen, and the ability to trigger actions in other ASs with communities and relay information between ASs. Um, the first question for me as a network researcher or science guy is what could actually go wrong in using them? Um, and we found out several things can go wrong. And the first thing we, we noticed is when we looked at how communities propagate, people um, seem not to expect them to propagate widely through the internet. Although we have two RFCs, actually defining how communities should propagate or should not propagate. RFC 1997 states communities are a transitive optional attribute, so they should be forwarded to your peers. And RFC 7454 says you should scrub communities you are using inside your network, so you cannot be uh, manipulated from outside, but forward foreign communities by other ASs. So it should be expected they, that they are actually um, propagating through the internet, but still, a lot of people do not expect this, and a lot of transit providers don't actually forward them. We only found 14% of transit providers propagating received communities. And yes, this value seems to be small, but the internet graph or the AS graph is highly connected, so you actually end up in communities traveling quite, quite a, a lot. But still, many people do not expect them to propagate it widely. And the problem here is that this leads to some potential for misuse. As they are propagating through the internet and can trigger actions multiple hops away, um, and there is no way for an operator to find out if this is intended or not, um, this leads into a problem. You cannot say, well, this is traffic management and this is legitimate or this is an attack. Um, and we ask ourselves the question if there are also unintended consequences in this uh, combination of BGP communities being transitive and forwarded and used for actually changing routing decisions. And our assessment in the end is, yes, there is a high risk for attacks, and we already see some attacks as well. So what we're looking at, um, of course, we took all of the publicly available BGP data we can find. And in the end, we find that 75% of BGP announcements that we looked at have at least one BGP community set. And in 2018, it were 5.6 thousand AESs. Now it's more than 10,000 AESs that make use of these short communities. Um, now, taking a step back and looking at the propagation again, um, what we can actually measure or what we cannot measure, uh, we have this very complex topology of four ASs, where AS1 is announcing a prefix P, and um, this is t uh, recorded in AS4, which could be a collector or just a simple peer, um, with the AS path 4321, as expected. And now AS2 is taking the prefix P with the community. In our case, 2 colon 303. So 2 is the AS actually defining the meaning of this community. And this will be transported finally to AS4. So AS4 is recording this community in its routing decision in its RIP. Um, so AS2 has added this informational community. Now AS2 is also adding a community for signaling or triggering an action in AS3, it's upstream. And this is also forwarded to AS4, 
So both of these communities are now present or visible in AS4, but AS4 cannot know who actually has added these communities, and so can't we. But we needed this for our measurements, so we had to come up with a solution. Um, for us, we can only that in fear infer which AS is adding a specific community. Um, by assuming that if the AS value or the AS number present in the community is actually the AS adding the community, we will get a lower bound of the travel distance or of the AS hop count. Uh, this will lead us for the uh, community 2303 with the correct travel distance of two AS hops and with the other community 3123 with the wrong assumed travel distance of one, uh, of also two, um, but it actually, uh, of, of, sorry, of one because it's just one AS hop, although correctly it would be two, but for us this lower bound of the distance of one hop is sufficient for our, for our work. So if we plot these values, which again is the lower, lower bound of travel distances, um, we end up with this ECDF. Um, on the x axis you see the AS hop count, and we find that 10% of communities have an AS hop count of more than six, so they traverse more than six different ASs um, from where we assume them to have been added. And more than 50% of communities still traverse more than four ASs. And if you compare this with the mean length of AS path that we have observed, which is around 4.5 or 4.7, um, this actually means it travels almost through the whole internet. And the longest community propagation we have observed were 11 AS hops. So they, they do propagate through the internet. Now, Looking at another very complex uh, AS topology, AS1, and again, announcing a prefix uh, to AS2, and adding a community, 3123, to inform AS3 or um, execute uh, path repending there, you will notice that this community value is also propagated to AS4 again. And although it's only um, intended for signaling something towards AS3, AS4 is also receiving an announcement with this community. So, we end up with uh, two different AS paths, and in the first case, um, we, for our, for our research, call this community to be on path because the AS value from the AS community from the community is present on the AS path that we record in AS3. In AS4, we call this community to be off path because the AS number three is not present on the AS path. It could also be that the AS that is being uh, signaled for is further hops away behind AS4 but um, in both cases, this would be called off-path because the AS number is not present on the recorded AS path. And if we now take the right part of these community values, uh, separate them by on-path and off-path, and plot this, we end up with this distribution. On the left side, you see uh, quite a number of um, community values in the off-path communities that are related to uh, black holing, remote triggered black holing. And on the other side, on the right-hand side, you see uh, very even numbers that look like provider, uh, like operator assigned and easy to remember. And we think that this comes from the fact that the, um, that ASs that are not implementing uh, black holding will just forward black holding re um, communities compared to ASs that uh, do black holding, which follow the uh, black holding RFC and do not further propagate these communities. So they will not be visible off path. Um, now coming to the experiments that we did to uh, show that there actually are some problems out there in the internet. Uh, all of the experiments were done first in a lab environment and then um, validated on the internet with, of course, operator consent. Um, and I will show two different scenarios in this talk. There are more in the paper and the configuration uh, of our routers are uh, available um, publicly. So first going back again, and giving an intro, how does remote triggered black holding is supposed to work? Um, so we know what we are talking about. AS1 is announcing a prefix to its upstream AS2, and then receiving traffic. This is expected behavior. Sometimes you have the problem that you receive more traffic than you actually want to attract. We call this a denial of service attack, and one mitigation is AS1 signaling to AS2 uh, that wants to black hole a prefix. Um, usually this is done in band in the same BGP peering session than the normal BGP um, announcements are being sent, 
but there are also cases where it's a, a special BGP session um, which has other problems but not the ones mentioned here. So AS1 is announcing the prefix P tagged with a black holding community to signal AS2 that it should drop traffic. AS2 is of course still announcing the prefix P to all its peers but without the black holding community. Now what happens is AS2 is now dropping traffic, not routing the traffic towards P at its border routers and the link between AS1 and AS2 is relieved from the out of service traffic uh, and is usable, usable. So you sacrifice parts of your network or parts of the prefix IP addresses um, to still keep all of the other prefixes and uh, the servers reachable. This is how it should work. What we noticed is that for this to be used in a secure fashion, you need to employ some safeguards. Um, of course, the provider that is providing black holing has to check if the customer is actually um, allowed to black hole these prefixes. So if these prefixes are owned by the customer or has, the, the customer has permissions to black hole them. Um, and this leads to the fact that you need different policies for customers and peers, different uh, access control lists, and leads to a lot of uh, configuration overhead for for a secure usage of remote triggered black holding. Um, and of course, in receiving uh, such communities, you have to add no advertise and no export to the announcement so you don't propagate it further. Uh, and we also noticed some providers translating black holding to the black holding communities of other upstreams. So uh, you were not even able to do selective black holding because they were translating it and announcing it to their peers as well, translating the actual values. Now, what should not be possible is depicted here. Uh, we have the same topology, but now AS2 is in the role of an attacker, uh, and AS2 should just be a backup path um, to, to the prefix of AS1, but AS2 is able to actually add the black hole in community, although it's not on the best path. So AS2 is announcing to AS3 that prefix P should be black hole, and we noticed AS3 is actually doing that although the best path is through AS1, and AS1 is the origin uh, for P, is not actually requesting any black holing. And the other problem that we noticed is that this is even possible if AS2 is not involved in, uh, in any uh, connection to AS1 at all. So AS1 can just hijack the prefix P and announce the prefix P with the black holing community set. And we noticed um, that in, in some cases we are able to circumvent ACLs and prefix filter lists uh, because the black holing uh, community is checked before any prefix filter lists are applied. So we were able to confirm this on the internet. Uh, it works multi-hop and it's, it's hard to spot because the community values are usually not monitored. Uh, reasons for that we found is the black holing prefix is uh, more specific, so you need uh, exception rules in your configuration to accept a slash 32, so essentially everything that's smaller than slash 24. Um, and some providers check the black holding community before applying any prefix filters. And we even found some uh, configuration guides on the internet which had this problem, and they were the example configuration provided. Um, and the problem here, there is no validation for the origin of the community. Every AS on a path can add the black holding community for the upstream provider. Now, um, yesterday, Job Snyders gave a talk at the um, IPG where he presented the mitigation for this. If you would check that the peer that is announcing the black holding uh, or the, the prefix with the black holding community is on the best path and only then accept the black holding, this is one possible mitigation for this attack. Uh, so he, if you are interested in that, you should uh, check the recordings of that talk. So, if you only accept the black holding, if the peer that is announcing the black holding for a prefix is your current best path to that prefix, uh, these problems go away. The second attack we were able to do uh, was a traffic redirection attack. Um, again, AS1 is announcing its prefix P, uh, and you see the current best path from AS6 to AS1 is through AS3 on the lower, lower side of the topology. Um, now AS2 is our attacker uh, announcing prefix P with uh, community to do uh, path prepending in AS3, which leads to the longer path over AS4 and 5 to be the preferred path for AS6. Why this attack could be interesting? Well, one thing could be there is a network tap between AS4 and 5, and if you, even if you would identify that AS2 is your attacker and you would 
screen the network of AS2, you will not find any network tab there because they on purpose redirected the traffic to AS4 and 5 where the actual network tab is. Uh, could be AS2 is being forced to cooperate here. And the other thing, it, it's, it, it could just be a denial of service attack uh, because it's known that the link between AS4 and 5 is a very thin link uh, with, less, with uh, not as much bandwidth as would be needed. So by redirecting traffic there, you could actually um, uh, fill that link there. And after I gave this presentation at the right meeting, we were actually um, approached by Dyne and they uh, pointed us to an article where they found our attacks that today are actually already using communities to uh, foster propagation of hijacks. So the attackers found out that by setting specific community values, their hijack would actually be propagated uh, more in the BGP uh, um, uh, network. So we already see attacks using communities. So what now? Uh, we identified uh, several well, topics where discussion may, uh, might be uh, useful. Um, we found problems with authenticity, transitivity, standards, documentation, and monitoring of community usage. Starting with authenticity, uh, I mentioned several times that every AS that is on the AS path is able to modify, add, or remove community values on announcements on, um, on, in, in BGP, and there is no attribution possible. It means even if you found out that there is an incident, you cannot find out who is actually responsible for that. Um, we all know RPKI, but intentionally this is not able to secure communities because we do want ASs in, on, on the AS path to modify routing and to add path prepending, for example. Um, on the other hand, we also see that operators rely on the correctness of uh, community values because they are basing policy decisions on for example, where a route has been learned. And large communities are there, but they only partially improve the situation because all of these points still apply to large communities. They only fix the first part of being an, an AS number. So the question is, how can we achieve authenticity or at least attribution? So after an incident, you know who you have to talk to to uh, prevent further problems uh, in the future. Another thing that could probably lead to big discussions here is uh, we know communities are very helpful in debugging because you know what is happening in the network and why certain networks are forwarding traffic in a certain way. Um, and they are indeed a very easy low overhead communications channel and widely in use, we still only see them being used one or two hops away. You usually do not signal uh, black holding five or six hops away or you do not uh, usually need to inform uh, peers six or seven hops away. Uh, so, on the other hand, you have a high risk for abuse in, in communities being transitive. So, the question is, do we have a high risk here or do we have more benefit? Do we need a discussion between benefit and risk uh, using uh, full transit or allowing community values or communities to be full transitive? Uh, monitoring is another uh, field full of uh, mis uh, misunderstandings. We know there is no global state in BGP. It's a highly distributed system. And even if we look at all of the route collectors that are available, we will only see the end result recorded at these collectors. We do not know what has happened on the path between uh, peers. Even if you are able to look into looking glasses manually, it's very hard to spot differences. So inferring modifications between the origin or the AS setting communities and the collector is almost impossible. Um, and even if you would be able to record all of these changes, you still have the problem that you do not know what these community values actually mean. And there is no universal way for attribution of uh, changes or recording who actually changed anything. So monitoring community values to detect abuse is extremely difficult in, in, this, in this field. And we have the other great field of standardization. Um, in the short communities, ASN colon value is still just convention. Um, we, can, we cannot really be sure that the, the first value is actually an AS number. Um, and there is no defined semantics. I know there have been a lot of discussions in the past that all uh, came to the point that, well, we cannot define semantics here. Um, but this leads to these problems stated. And 
by, by communities being used both for signaling and for triggering and not being able to distinguish what is what, you cannot even filter uh, communities in a, in a sensible way. Um, and until now, there are only a, a lim it's only a limited set of standardized communities. And you cannot be sure if, for example, some AS is not actually using some arbitrary value for triggering backhauling. So uh, standardization here might be a, a thing that, that should be uh, further, uh, further pushed forward. Um, doing our research, we found another very large problem. Uh, this is with documentation, um, because all of the AS's can uh, define their communities themselves. Um, there is no need for documentation. There is no central point of documentation. We found that some of the AS's are, uh, the, are documenting um, them in who is in IOR databases. Uh, on their websites, some are only providing um, community documentation in customer portals or not even at all. So if you see a community, you cannot find out in an easy way what they mean. Uh, and even if there is documentation, it's often in a natural, in natural language, and parsing this is impossible. We tried, we failed. Um, if you have a very limited scope, for example, trying to find out the communities used for geolocation or for, for geotagging of prefixes, uh, you can, of course, look for city names, airport codes, things like that. But parsing community documentation in a, in a general purpose, for a general purpose application um, is, is not really feasible. So documentation is very limited and fragmented. It's very hard to actually find out uh, a dictionary um, or find a dic dictionary for community uh, meanings. Um, again, uh, things are happening on that. Uh, on that. I learned that uh, DTAC is, uh, is, has internally developed a system, what they call for community structuring. Um, they are only using string representations instead of community values internally, and these string representations are then translated to short and large community values for their router configuration. An example would be tag.origin.country.de, where DE is a, a parameter for the community definition tag origin country. So you see it's a hierarch hierarchical a system where it says, well, this community is a tagging community. It's a, it has passive semantics it is taking an origin on the country level, and the country is Germany. And their system allows the definition of parameters to communities, and these parameters with the communities together are documented in one system. Uh, they have working code, and they are using this in production already. Um, right now, they have uh, an internal internet draft-like document, and if you are interested in that, you probably should, should talk to Rüdiger, who's sitting there and laughing. Um, so I think this is a great way for actually starting to document communities in a sensible way because you don't have to operate with magical numbers uh, and you can actually um, distribute these documentations and talk about policies and filters with your peers because you, have to, you can talk with, with, with strings and no magical numbers. And even if you have other router configurations, you can still use these string representations and you know what you're talking about. Um, then we came up with some recommendations for operators uh, based on our work. Um, of course, as the RFC already states, you should filter all informational com community values that you are using that carry your AS number. So if you are using communities to tag where a prefix has been learned, you should scrub these communities when you receive them from your peers because they are defined by you internally and used by you internally. Uh, it might be useful to come up with agreements with your downstreams so to define what they are allowed to do with your upstreams, if they are actually allowed to do path prepending with your upstream for their prefixes. Um, of course, publicly documenting you, the communities you are using is key to enable other ASs to filter action communities to you. So if I have a customer where I know he might be playing around with, with BGP, I might want to filter things so he cannot trigger things in my upstream. Um, but you need agreements for that, if you are able, actually allowed to filter these or not, or define what they are allowed to do. And one, one thing, one request, if you are providing public looking glasses, which is a good idea, uh, please also show the community values that, re that you receive. Otherwise, it's very hard to debug things. So um, coming back to the, to the general problem, BGP communities are currently the only feasible way to realize signaling between ASs, um, but the problem is that the secure usage requires good operational knowledge and diligence. 
We do not think that a very over complex system is really suitable to secure the shortcomings of BGP communities. Um, but we have to be aware that there is a problem. And while everybody in this room is probably able to handle this and do everything correct all the time, um, we cannot rely on that on a global scale. There are a bunch of people out there who do not know what they are doing, and there will never be a world in, in which everybody is doing everything correct. Um, so the question is, do we still uh, can rely on, on, or do we still want protocols that allow people to make mistakes that will break other people's network? Or do we need an evolution in protocols here uh, that are less fragile and, pro in, and, and more usable or, other, or a little bit other um, to, to, to prevent people shooting themselves and others into the, in, the, in the food? So, um, wrapping up, uh, communities are widely in use. Um, they are used to realize policies. They are needed. Um, but they heavily rely on mutual trust between the peers um, because there is no authenticity and security in place. There is no attribution. Attacks are very hard to detect. And uh, one takeaway from our experiments, we did some prefix hijacking that was reported on Twitter, but nobody actually spotted our redirection attacks based on communities. So we cannot be sure if there are other people already doing attacks using communities. If you're interested in more details, the paper is available. Here's the link. And uh, with a picture of my cat, I'm happy to take questions. We have time for a few questions, if people want. Um, and um, I would start with a question. To what extent have the people who, done, who did this research um, brought forward any standards, uh, any working group proposals to, um, to make the changes? Again? Have, you, have, your, um, have the group who wrote this paper brought forward any work to the routing ITF side of the world about I th changes? I think we did not yet because we are in a state where we, well, assessing the problem and, well, showing everybody there is a problem. Yeah. Um, Okay. And I don't know how to fix it, but I thought there this is might expert. attract Randy to the mic. Uh, one of the co pardon me, Randy Bush, IIJ and Arcus. Um, one of the co authors strongly objected both in working group last call and I ETF last call to the black hole well known community. Understood. <laughs> Randy Bush, everybody. Okay. Uh, anybody else have a question? Well, not, not so much question, but uh, uh, one comment is when you say there is no authenticity, uh, that is not completely true. Uh, the thing is, one has to recognize here that, well, okay, the community system is offering uh, um, a range of uh, stuff where people, where operators can be creative. Uh, and you have, in the global system, you have to control the creativity and the interaction of the various create creators. Um, but in the end, you have to see that, yes, uh, you always have bilateral relations mm -hmm. that are mapped into BGP neighbor, uh, neighbor, ne uh, neighborship relations. And yes, what is exchanged there should be seen as something that is essentially just bilateral. And yes, if you, if you want to be a responsible actor in the whole system, you have to really control what you are doing with your neighbors. And if you really take that understanding, you can actually start to build stuff that says, well, okay, you and me are peering. I'm a responsible person. Mm -hmm. I make an agreement what we are doing on our relation. And for that, if you and me are doing a decent effort at controlling, at doing the right policy, 
for implementing our agreement, we actually have a chance for using that as fairly trustworthy. And I might even, I might even go out and offer you an agreement in which I, in which I promise you that I'm doing stuff where I'm, relati where I'm relating to you in a controlled manner uh, the communities that Randy is sending to me. This is something that does not work recursively over the whole topology. But that with that very limited and closed understanding, one actually can do stuff. And yes, having better documentation, have a, having more tools for doing it, will help a lot to do this right. Because a lot of the spreading of dubious information that you have observed is related to the fact that many of the operators uh, just at, at the time when they 10 years ago did their policy, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have good tools and they did not really take care of the responsibility. But, but that was what I meant with you have to talk to your downstreams to make clear what you are allowed to filter because if you don't have any agreement <coughs> exactly and you just strip all of the, uh, their communities yes uh, this could lead into other problems even yeah. legally and that has that has to go that has to go with a very strict understanding into the BCPs that we are using before you start Jeff I, um, people should forward around the blue sheets and this will be the last question for this talk <coughs> Very useful work. Thank you for bringing it. Uh, I mean, this is well known, and we've been facing this for the last 15 years, probably since <coughs> mostly started doing remote black holing. The mitigation today is mostly basic hygiene. You take care of what you accept, and you take care of what you send. There are some intended consequences in very useful stuff, things like uh, bandwidth communities that are very useful in data centers. They were made non-transitive just to avoid these issues while most data centers use EBGP, we cannot propagate this community. So there's work definitely needed that would allow us to use very useful stuff. And thank you again. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, last but not least um, is our ANRP 2018 awardee um, from who would have been in Bangkok but for visa issues. Oh, and um, that's Arash Molavi Kahi, and he is at Thousand Eyes now, and the work was done at, at Northeastern University, um, and taking a long look at Quick. Oh, can you uh, click on the slides for him? It should be in there. Is it not? Okay. <clears throat> yes, this is the case where we talked about at lunch where you give the talk without the slides. <laughs> Hopefully this not. Is, this is where the uh, research group chairs can work the laptop. Colin, you're better right. at well, me than this than is it, loading. I just want to add one note. I'm going to go through some background ma material and history of Quick. Uh, oh no! <laughs> uh, to bring up to speed those folks who might not be super familiar with Quick. Perfect. So, if you are an expert on Quick and you know the background material, I apologize in advance. Please bear with me as I go through it. All right, so I'm going to be talking about taking a long look at QUIC. This was a measurement work that appeared at IMC 2017. And uh, I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room that internet connectivity is important, but just to set the stage and put things in perspective, in uh, 2015, uh, 3.2 billion people had access to internet. Obviously, that number has increased over the past four years, but in that same year, the number of people with running water was less than that. Now, these two numbers next to each other are, I find them depressing, but for reasons that uh, are out of the scope of this talk, but it, uh, it uh, emphasizes the importance of internet connectivity. We use it in our personal life, in our prof professional life, 
Uh, virtually every business depends on the internet and their viability is tied to the performance of the network that they're operating on. So naturally, there's a lot of effort to try to improve these networks uh, and make them more reliable and more performant. ITF is one of those efforts. And uh, we do a lot of things. We come up with new protocols. We use traffic uh, management techniques to make sure that our networks are utilized in the way that uh, everyone's demands are met. And we even design our applications to adapt themselves to the underlying network, so we increase the user experience, improve the user experience. And uh, while well, Quick is uh, one of those efforts, it's, it's a transport protocol. It stands for Quick UDP Internet Connection. And it started uh, in Google, and it was basically a transport protocol designed with today's needs in mind. Quick was designed for a bunch of main reasons. The first one was to facilitate rapid deployment. What does that mean? If you think about HTTP, you have HTTP, hopefully you have TLS underneath, and it's running on TCP, which is your transport protocol. And as you all know, TCP is part of the it's implemented in the kernel. So it's in the kernel space. What does that mean? That means if whenever you have a big change, let's say for TCP and you want to deploy it at scale, everyone needs to update their operating system. And we all know that could take a long time. Uh, Windows XP's that are still around as, as an evident to that fact. So Quick solves that problem by implementing in the user space. So <clears throat> now what this means is that is that whenever you have a new version of Quick, all you need to do is, let's say, if you're browsing the web and you're using a browser, all the users need to do is to update their browser, and then they have the new version of Quick. Obviously, this means that a lot of things, like a lot of guarantees that the TCP pro provides, like reliable delivery, now all of those also have to be uh, implemented in the user space, which I get to in a little bit what that means in terms of performance. But uh, overall, this helps with uh, rapid deployment. Another main reason was qu uh, for Quick, which Google never shied away about pointing out, was to avoid ossification by middle boxes. We all know there are many middle boxes in networks. These could be NATs or security firewalls or it could be web caches and many other applications. Um, a lot of them do claim that they improve performance. Perhaps in some cases they do. But there's also a lot of evidence that they actually do more harm than, than good. Uh, one of uh, the f examples that I find very interesting, this, is, uh, this was a joint work by Google and T-Mobile. Uh, it was uh, a few years ago. It was presented at Velocity Conference, where they basically looked at uh, YouTube's traffic over T-Mobile's network and how does it interact with their web proxies. And this is a summary of findings from their slides. They basically found that it's better that YouTube traffic does not go through the proxies because they're hurting their performance. And I don't want to point any fingers to T-Mobile or YouTube. This is, this is not an issue isolated to them. Another example, this is taken from a Cloudflare blog post where they were basically saying we had TLS 1.3 enabled for a while, but no one was using it because the browsers were not supporting it, and they were not basically support turning it on because middle boxes were breaking it. And uh, to be fair, it wasn't just middle boxes. There were other, other issues that prevented TLS 1.3 from be, being deployed at scale, but middle boxes were not helping. TCP fast open is another example that a lot of folks believed it, didn't, it never got deployed at scale because of middle boxes, and the list goes on. So, and all of these things can happen because in TCP, all of your headers are in the clear. So middle boxes can see them and act upon them. They can modify them, drop them, add headers, or break your connections into two, all the things that you're familiar with. Whereas in Quick, pretty much everything is encrypted, so you take all that uh, from middle boxes. They can't, they can't uh, do any ossifications or meddling. And uh, finally, uh, Quick was in, uh, proposed to improve performance. 
I just a side note here, I have performance for HTTP traffic. I should mention that Quick is eventually going to be a general purpose transport protocol, but it was start it started with HTTP in mind and it's that's its biggest use case right now and it's very integrated with HTTP. So Throughout this talk, whenever I say quick, we are basically going to focus on HTTP over quick. So whenever I say quick, I mean HTTP over quick. So quick improves performance by a number of optimizations. The most famous one is zero RTT uh, connection uh, establishment. If you're familiar with TCP, you have that three-way handshake to establish a connection before you can send any data. If you have TLS, on top of TCP, as you should, well, there, there's going to be more RTTs. Uh, and Quick tries to achieve zero RTT connection, uh, zero RTT uh, yeah, connection. Th what that means is that you can start sending data from the very first packet. Obviously, that doesn't always work. You should have contacted the server before and have valid keys for zero RTT to work. If you don't, then it's going to be one or two RTTs. But after that, everything else is going to be zero RTT. Um, quick prevents head of, log, head of line blocking. What is that? If you have a HTTP stream, if it's HTTP 1, you have a stream, you have to open a TCP connection. If you have more than one stream, then you have to open more TCP connections, and we all know that's not uh, that all those connections have uh, overhead. They're competing over bandwidth, so it's not a great use of resources. HTTP2 solves this by multiplexing uh, HTTP streams into a single TCP connection. This is great; it gets rid of a lot of overhead. However, if any of these streams is blocked for whatever reason, then all of those streams are blocked. And the reason for this is because TCP is agnostic to the HTTP streams. As long as TCP is concerned, you have a stream of bytes that needs to go from one end to the other end. And Quick solves this by basically mapping HTTP streams into Quick streams. Now, having those logic, that logic of streams in Quick if one of these streams is blocked, the rest of them are not going to be blocked and can, be, can proceed normally. Uh, Quick has an improved loss recovery. It, help, it, it mitigates the ambiguity problem that TCP has. It has better RTT and bandwidth estimation. A lot of this uh, uh, good loss recovery comes from the fact that you can easily change the congestion uh, control as well. Uh, so for example, if you have BBR, a new congestion control, you can easily replace your old one with the new one. And that comes from the fact that the first uh, point that I talked about, you can easy, you can, everything is applica in application layer, so you can easily update things and deploy it at scale. And there are a lot of other optimizations that I'm not going to go into all of it, but basically Quick try to learn from decades of transport protocol evolution and take the good things that worked and put it into a single protocol. A little bit of uh, history, Quick started in early 2010s uh, at Google, as I said. Uh, I think it was in 2013 that it was publicly announced and Google started using it. Soon after, there was a spec draft and uh, towards the end of 2016, the ITF working group started and the working group has been very active. There are many implementation of uh, Quick around now. Quick, uh, Google's Quick is at version 47 now and the working group is working fast and hopefully soon we're going to have a standard version of Quick and uh, everyone's going to be using that. All right, so that's, that's why Quick started and a little bit of history of it. And, uh, but as I said, Quick was start, one of the main reasons for Quick was improved performance. So Google has been reporting on Quick's performance. They've been using it heavily and uh, they've been uh, re uh, putting out reports that it helps with page load time, with YouTube rebuffering and all these great numbers that it's perfect and it's very promising. However, the issue with these is that they're all aggregated statistics and not really reproducible by anyone else unless you're Google and you have access to that data. And they don't really report any controlled tests. Again, everything is aggregated statistics. There, at the time that we started our work, there were other evaluations of Quick in the research uh, venues. However, most of them were limited in environments, networks, limited tests, and uh, 
Uh, they used old untuned versions of Quake, which I will get into in a bit what that means. And the results that they provided were not necessarily statistically uh, sound, neither they provide good cause analysis for the performances that they observe. So we basically wanted to bridge those gaps, like fill in those gaps and provide a more comprehensive uh, evaluation of Quick and how does it compare to TCP. So as I said, we're gonna look at HTTP's performance and we're, we're gonna compare Quick and TCP. Uh, we have a very simple setup. We have a client on one end, which could be a desktop client or a mobile client. We have a server on the other end, which supports both uh, Quick and TCP. And we have a, the network in between. We can emulate different conditions and see how the two uh, <coughs> compare to each other. Our servers uh, host a bunch of web pages and objects with different sizes and pages with different objects sizes and different number of objects and we fetch them using uh, Quick and TCP, and we compare the performance. And I must point out that even though I'm not gonna go into the details, we run, once we get all the results, we run a statistical test to make sure any difference that we see is not due to noise or network variations or things that are not really differences between the protocols. So whenever we report a difference between the two protocols, we are confident that this is the difference in performance or not noise or anything else. So the setup is pretty simple, but in 2016, when we were doing these tests, we had this big issue of finding, having a server that supports quick. It, it's not like TCP, there, there wasn't a quick module for Apache servers, there weren't many options around. So basically our two real options were either use Google servers, because Google at the time had Quick basically host our stuff on Google servers and run our tests against Google, or use a, a server that comes within the Chromium code base. Well, the first option, Google servers, didn't really work for us for the first obvious reason that we had no control over it. So if we want to change something in the server or get some logs from it, well, we couldn't, because we didn't, we didn't own those servers. And the second issue was that we actually started seeing some unexpected behavior when we were testing against Google. And uh, so here I have one example to give you an idea of what I mean by that. Uh, we uploaded a 10 megabyte object to Google App Engine and then we downloaded it using our client. And this bar plot is, the red part is showing the time to first byte and the blue part of it is showing the time that it takes for the rest of the download. And as you can see, there's this huge wait time. It's like it's, it's half a second. So basically one third of our download time is wait time. And we did some tests. We realized this wait time kind of exists in Google App Engine. We, did, we, wasn't sure, we weren't sure why it's happening. Obviously we didn't have any control to the server to, to investigate this more. And this was not good for us because if we're, down, uh, if we're uh, checking performance and comparing millisecond times, a half a second uh, wait time uh, is, is not okay. So we decided to use the server in the Chromium. However, so this is the bar on the left is doing the exact same experiment, but with the Chromium server, uh, the server that's part of Chromium. Now you can see that verb, uh, huge wait time is gone. That's great. But now our download time is much bigger compared to Quick, uh, to Google, I'm sorry. And this is problematic because this is basically these uh, two plots next to each other are, are telling me that the server in Chromium cannot provide the performance that Quick is able to provide because we, we clearly see that Google is doing better. So we had to try to uh, basically infer what are the configuration that Google servers are using and, and basically fine tune our a Chromium server to make sure it uh, matches the performance that Google gives. So we did that along the way. We found some bugs and basically we fixed it. I'm not going to go into the details, but happy to talk about it offline. But after we did that, the plot on the right, uh, the bar on the light, right, is basically the same experiment using our Chromium server after adjusting it. And not only we don't we don't have that big wait time now, our download time is similar to what Google provides. And this is obviously not the only test that we ran. We did a bunch of tests, 
And uh, this is not great, but we used Google as our baseline and matched our performance to Google. And I spent time on this slide to explain it because there were a bunch of research work before us that uh, they did a lot of great work with Quick, but uh, none of them went through this step to optimize the server. And pretty much all of them reported poor performance for Quick, at least in some scenarios, which for a fact we know it's because they were using a server that was not performant. All right, so now that we have our setup complete, our test bed complete, uh, we did some tests. So I'm going to start uh, showing you results uh, from a desktop client. And uh, I'm going to show you some simple results where we're downloading different object sizes from 5 kilobyte to 10 megabyte. And we're downloading them at different bottleneck bandwidths. And we're comparing how quick and TCP perform compared to each other. So in this case, the RTT is 36 milliseconds. The loss is uh, insignificant. And those numbers, so 45, 44%, what that means is that when we're downloading that five kilobyte object using Quick and TCP, uh, the download time for Quick is 45% better than TCP. Now, to avoid bombarding you with a lot of numbers, I'm going to replace that with a heat map. So just think of it as red means quick is doing better, blue means uh, TCP is doing better, and white means there's no statistically significant difference between the two protocols. So if I uh, complete this plot, you can see pretty much in, in every bottleneck bandwidth and for every object size, quick is doing better than TCP. We're able to download the object faster, so this is great. Uh, we added, we threw in some loss into the picture and we saw still Quick is doing uh, pretty much better than TCP in all cases. We increased the RTT time, we worked with different RTTs. In this example, RTT is 112 milliseconds. Again, Quick was doing way better than TCP, so so far everything was great and uh, we were very excited. And then um, we did this experiment where we added some packet reordering. And as soon as we added packet reordering, things started to change. And we actually <laughs> saw, uh, we actually saw case, uh, cases, especially when that's covering the plot, but the blue, uh, the right side of the plot are big objects. The last column is a 10 megabyte object. So when we have a packet reordering, uh, Quick is doing worse than TCP. So we wanted to see why this is happening. We looked at Quick's code, instrument, uh, instrumented the code, looked at TCP to see how uh, it's uh, coping with packet reordering. And basically what we found is that TCP has this mechanism. When you have packets reordered, it increases it, its NAC, and it can cope with that reordering, whereas Quick didn't have that mechanism in place. And when packets were reordered uh, deeper than its NAC, it was basically thinking that those packets are lost. So it was going into loss recovery, and we all know what that means, and it was uh, that per performance was going down. So we wanted to see if Quick can actually benefit from the same mechanism that TCP has. Uh, our guess was yes, but we wanted to test it. So I'm gonna, I think this is not working. <laughs> oh. Sorry, I went ahead. All right, so we, we the NAC threshold, the default NAC threshold for Quake was three. So we wanted to see, and uh, I'm looking at the example when we're downloading a 10 megabyte object. So it's a big object, it's a sizable transfer. And we wanted to see if Quake can benefit with it from the same mechanism as TCP. So we started playing with the NAC. And we actually saw that um, there's a big latency between my clicker and the <laughs> slide. And we saw that as, actually as we increase the NAC, Quick, Quick's performance actually gets better. And when we let the NAC to increase up to 300, which is actually the, the number that TCP, the uh, upper bound that TCP is allowed to uh, increase its NAC, then Quick is able to recover. It, it's able to cope with the uh, packet reordering and actually starts performing better than TCP. Uh, all right, so next thing that we wanted to look at was zero RTT, because that's, that's a big improvement. Uh, that's a, one of the improvements in Quick. So we wanted to see how much zero RTT helped with performance. 
And uh, I'm going to go to back to our base example with, where there's no loss and we have a 36 millisecond RTT. As I talked about, Quick is doing much better than TCP. This is Quick versus TCP. So this time we ran a test and instead of comparing Quick with TCP, what we're comparing is Quick with zero RTT and Quick without zero RTT. And uh, red means Quick with zero RTT is doing better. And as you can see in the plot, most of the plot is red which is great, but also as you have noticed, this benefit of zero RTT is really, uh, you can really sense it when the object size is small. And when your object is big, naturally, because your transfer is, is longer and your connection time is, is a very small fraction of your transaction, so it doesn't have a big, big effect. Which is still great, because if you think about web, most of the time you're actually requesting very small objects. So, so this zero RTT can help a lot in, that, in, in those scenarios. Uh, sorry. So comparing these two uh, plots together, as we said, zero RTT only helps for smaller objects. But we can see that Quick is doing better for bigger objects as well. So we want to see what is it that the Quick does that uh, helps it to perform better. So I have an experiment here which is a little bit extreme, but I like it because it helps visualizing things a little bit better. So what we have here is we have a case that the bandwidth is changing between 50 millisecond, uh, I'm sorry, 50 megabits per second to 150 megabits per second. So it's a little bit of extreme of an example. But we're, and we're downloading a 200 megabyte object, so it's a very long transfer. Using the TCP and Quick, we're doing it back to back. That's what this plot is showing. On the x-axis, I have time, and on the y-axis, I have throughput. And as you can see, Quick is able to achieve a much higher average throughput compared to TCP, which explains why uh, it's able to get such a uh, better performance, especially when there's loss. So basically. The takeaway is Quick is way more aggressively and better adapting itself to the changes to, to the available bandwidth, which is great, but also made us think if Quick is so aggressive in adapting itself to, to available bandwidth, how is it going to play with fairness to other traffic? Because as we know, we want different flows to be fair to each other, so not, no flow shuts down other flows. So we made TCP and Quick uh, compete with each other over bottleneck bandwidth, and we actually found out that Quick is not fair to TCP. We found out that Quick is taking more than share, share bandwidth. We repeated that experiment with, when Quick is competing with multiple TCP uh, flows, and we still got the same results. And to make sure this is not our environment, we made Quick and Quick compete with Quick, things were fair, TCP com uh, competing with TCP, everything was fair. But when the two protocols were competing with each other, Quick was not being fair to TCP. We wanted to dig in a little bit deeper. So uh, here I have the congestion window size for the two protocols. They're, in this example, they're both using uh, Cubic. And uh, as you can see, they start from the same congestion window size, but quickly, quick uh, increases the congestion window and takes an unfair share of the bandwidth and causes TCP to basically slow down. And to zoom in, you can actually see that quick is way more aggressively increasing its uh, congestion window. Uh, all right, so I have one last thing to talk about before I run out of time, and that is uh, mobile devices. So everything I talked about so far, the client is a desktop device. And again, going to my base example of no loss and 36 millisecond RTT, <clears throat> we saw that Quick is doing better than TCP in most cases. However, we redid the same exact experience experiment, but this time the client is a mobile phone, and uh, what we saw is that, well, while Quick is uh, still doing at least as good as TCP, you don't see any blue cells in there, but the performance gains of Quick started to diminish. So Quick is doing better in TCP, but the gap is not as big as for a desktop client. So we want to see why this is happening. And what we did, we instrumented the Quick code to try to infer a state machine and see what's happening in, in, in Quick and what states the uh, 
the protocol is in at every time. So I'm going to show you uh, this state machine where, for the case where we're downloading a 10 megabyte object at uh, 50 megabits per second. And it looks something like this. It's a classical state machine. You have different states, the percentage of time that you spend in every state, the probability, the transition probabilities. This is a little bit difficult to read, so I'm going to replace it with a table. And as soon as I do that, hopefully things are going to become clear. As you can see, when, when we're using a desktop machine, Quick is in application limited state for only 7% of the time. And that's the state that the, the, the client is receiving data faster than you can consume it. But as soon as you go to a mobile device where resources are more scarce, now Quick is in application limited state for 60% of the time. And this is exactly the price that Quick is paying for being implemented in the user space. You're constantly context switching between user space and kernel space, so, which is fine on a resourceful device, but when you're on a mobile device, things are, are not that great. Uh, so that's all I had to talk about. Uh, to sum it up, uh, we looked at the protocol that was uh, rapidly evolving, and honestly, sometimes it felt like uh, 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 measuring moving sand. Uh, uh, we uh, <clears throat> did tests in a variety of networks and environments. Uh, there are a bunch of other tests that I uh, didn't have time to talk about, but I encourage you to read the paper if you're interested in. And uh, we instrumented the code, uh, extracted some uh, state machine, and uh, that helped us to provide some root cause analysis for the performances that we were seeing. And finally, I just want to point out that this work was done two years ago. So at the time, Quick was at version 36. As I said, now Google Quick is at version 47. However, nothing stops us from doing the exact same measurement on the new versions. We actually did that in the paper. We looked at Quick from version 25 to 36. So we had that evolution of uh, Quick's performance. And we can do the same thing for, for newer versions and future versions. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Jake Holland, um, could you go back to slide 19, please? Sorry, the clicker. Yeah. There we um, go. I wanted to ask, uh, so this is very interesting, and thank you for, for presenting it. Uh, I wanted to ask, did you measure the retransmit rate in this, uh, in this uh, bottom scenario? I measure the what? I'm sorry. The retransmit rate? Um, I think we did, but honestly, at the top of my head, I don't remember. I have to go back and <laughs> look at the paper. Uh, okay, and um, okay, thank you. So that would be in the paper, if you. I believe so, but if okay. it's not, I'm more than happy to dig in and find it because we have all the data. Like we we didn't remove anything. Great, thank you. Um, and one follow up. I, I believe it was two slides forward, perhaps three. The fairness question. Um, <laughs> and I have a lot of. <laughs> uh, no, the, the in uh, forward. Uh, so slide twenty twenty one or twenty two, I think it was. So if you want to go ahead with your the, question, I'll try the, to. Uh, it's about the fairness. So okay. um, what I wanted to ask about was. Uh, you notice the difference in the fairness where, where uh, and I, I assume you mean that Quick was consuming a higher proportion of the bandwidth. Did you uh, compare that to sort of the expectation as observed here that, that Quick uh, performs better than TCP normally? So TCP will, pr that this must mean presumably that TCP will leave some of the uh, bandwidth underutilized or less utilized? And uh, is it the same proportion here, or how far different is it? Uh, 
I'm sorry, I don't think I understood the question. So you're saying if the ball neck bandwidth was underutilized? Right, so my, my uh, maybe this is too complicated to ask at the mic. Um, but what I was trying to get at is that we expect that Quick will perform better than TCP based on the prior observations, even when they're not competing, right? Which means that on the same kind of link, uh, TCP is leaving, must be leaving some bandwidth under, uh, unutilized in order for Quick to be able to beat it, right? So how, how much is the fairness difference sort of uh, disproportionately, uh, it, it, is it different than the difference between, and, and by how much, than the difference between their performance when they're not competing? Uh, if I understood your question correctly, you're asking that if TCP, when not comparing, was basically leaving some of the available bandwidth on the table, and if the difference was Right. So it's like, is this, is this really a competition fairness question, or is it just a, yes, it is indeed running faster? No, it's definitely a uh, fairness issue, because uh, I don't know if this answers your question, but we did this for very long, so it, we let them both get to that equilibrium, and we could see that when there is no competition, TCP is able to utilize the bandwidth arm almost fully. If okay. Okay, okay. That makes yes, sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, like, you, so they all went to that 10 megabyte, uh, sort of where it's when the, the transaction okay. is long enough. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. And yeah. sorry, one last one. The TCP was both of them are running cubic. You said. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you. That was one of my questions. So I have a clarification question and a larger question. The clarification question is: What's the queuing discipline you are running in your bottleneck? What's the what? What's the queuing discipline you're running in your bottleneck link? Uh, were you running uh, BBR? Were you running Red, AQM, Droptail? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Okay. I have to go it, back. Is it in to the paper? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll follow up if it isn't. Um, the larger question is uh, sort of going back to your very initial remarks. Uh, I'm really kind of first. Great work, very interesting, nicely presented. Thank you. This is a good paper. Uh, thank Thanks. you for coming here and presenting it. Um, I'm interested uh, uh, in the uh, 200 million users who have internet and no electricity, right? Uh, and so um, I think that there's a lot of attention being paid to quick as, uh, you know, higher performance and, uh, you know, better utilization of, uh, of congested resources. Um, but I rarely see performance numbers when you look at things like, uh, you know, very heavily multiplexed long RTT T1 links that have dial up at the end. Um, and, uh, you know, and users who are, you know, desperately trying to, you know, load simple web pages. Um, and I'd be really interested in seeing some comparison. I mean, we really want to make that sure those users don't get screwed if the world migrates from TCP to QUIC. We, you know, it's not great now, but it, ideally you wouldn't want it to be worse. So I'm wondering if you spend any time looking at it. You know, there's a little bit here. You can sort of take the worst cases of all the things you presented and add them up, and, you know, maybe that's what it is. But... So I guess closest to that that we experimented, we looked at some 3G uh, mobile networks. So we ran some tests there, and we actually found out that uh, our results showed that Quick is actually doing better than, T than TCP. And uh, it's in the paper. The reason I didn't put it in here, because we kind of, the things that I put in here, I want to be cases that I can isolate and then show where the difference is coming from. Yeah. But, and in like, in networks that, uh, and uh, as I said, we found in 3G networks and uh, poor networks that Quick is still doing better than TCP, but uh, most of our experiments were in controlled environments that were hard bandwidth. Right. So I would just add to that that you might look at adding like very long RTTs in there and then looking at things like fairness and seeing how that compares. That I don't have any intuition about how that would turn Yeah, I believe in our test we went up to 300 milliseconds of RTT. And That's we not could yet one satellite hop, but it's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> Christian Grothoff, uh, you always say TCP, but I'd like to know, are you using TCP segmentation offload, are you using TCP fast open, or are you using TCP from the 70s? So, <laughs> true. So, uh, we, I believe the segmentation offload is, is on. It's in the paper. Uh, we basically wanted to 
take a Linux box and use the TCP as is and don't change anything. And we did this on, a purpo on purpose because obviously you can uh, optimize any protocol to... Yeah, but on a Linux box, I can turn TCP fast open on or off very easily with the kernel option. I don't know what you did. That's why I'm asking. Uh, well, all the default values that came with it. Uh, uh, they're all in the paper. Uh, Gabriel Montenegro, Microsoft. Um, so thank you very much for, for this work. And um, I think I heard you say that there may be some ongoing work going on, some more research. So if that's the case, uh, could I add a suggestion that I mean, G Quick or Google Quick is, 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 is all fine and, 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 and good. But uh, the whole focus of the ITF effort is iQuick, right? The, the uh, ITF Quick. It would be great, and there's several implementations out there that you could use. Um, if you would uh, use those for the next phase of, of the testing, because that's a pretty different protocol, really, by, by today. And the best part of it is, if you find something egregious or something that might need to be tweaked, then there's still time to uh, go back to the working group and actually have an effect on the on the protocol. If if that's one of the of your findings. Uh, and that would be potentially more relevant for the future than GQuick, because supposedly everybody at some point will be on, on ITF Quick. So that, that's one, one suggestion. Um, and the other one is, is more of a comment. Y you indicated that uh, since um, Quick is implemented in user space, um, that's one implementation. Ours, for example, runs kernel or user, doesn't matter. So you could run it in kernel, you could run it in user space. It's not part of the protocol itself, right? So I understand that uh, for the test you needed to do, of course, it was easier to, to get the user space, but um, that's not really part of the, of the protocol definition. So you could run it in, in kernel, and then maybe some of the disadvantages that you identified would, would go away in, uh, in the mobile case, that, as you mentioned. Yeah, that's it. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, at the time we uh, were basically working with uh, Google's Quick, and that was pretty much the only option we had. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Okay, let's have a hand for Arash. <laughs> Excellent. ANRP talks. Um, so to pitch for the remaining remainder of the year, there's four more great ANRP talks to come. Um, if you want the links and you can't find them for some reason. Uh, I did put up a, um, an agenda slide set that is in the tracker, so you can um, find that and also a humorous prog-related picture. But in any event, um, thank you for being here and thanks for the great questions for our, our folks. And end of IRTF Open. <laughs>